So um, the decadal survey recognized that looking for a mission from the CGM and the IGM is a discovery potential, uh, a discovery area of great potential for the next decade. I've been thinking about this for 20 years, more than 20 years, uh, and I just wanted to say to the young people in the audience, keep doing the things that, you know, bring you funding and all that, but at the same time, if you have a crazy idea, don't give up. You may have to get tenure, you may have to build an instrument, you may have to build more than one instrument, but it's worth it if it's a great idea. So um, I'm going to talk briefly about the IGM project, what we're doing, uh, touch on inflows and outflows, the connection to galaxies, uh, and then focus mostly on IGM emission. Uh, the, the basic idea is to try to observe something like this, a, a true, true emission from the uh, general IGM. Okay, why IGM? Well, most of the gas is there. Um, and uh, there's this galaxy IGM-CGM coevolution. Uh, and <laughs> the IGM delineates the architecture of the universe. So it seems kind of important. Um, we uh, want to understand how Lyman Alpha, because it's the brightest line, it's also the most problematic radio transfer, uh, traces the baryons, uh, use, the, use the brighter CGM emission to, to dis trace inflows and outflows, and the coalition of galaxies, and correlating those with galaxy properties and evolutionary states, uh, and then hopefully discover the filaments of the cosmic web between galaxies, connecting galaxies, uh, and ultimately even use that for cosmology. It's a dream. Okay, so the, the program which was going on at Caltech involving many other institutions as well over the years, uh, basically trying to uh, go from the high redshift universe, the epic of realization, uh, with uh, first the Palomar Cosmic Imager and now the Keck Cosmic Web Imager, for which the Red Channel is coming on very soon. Uh, at medium redshift, uh, or at low redshift, we have to go to the space. Uh, that requires a new explorer, but as a prototype, we have the Fireball Balloon program uh, to test both technology and science uh, precursors. Uh, the methods, uh, multi-object and uh, imaging spectroscopy using slicers, uh, precision sky subtraction, particularly on the ground where the sky is, is ominously bright. Uh, and uh, in the space, we need high efficiency, low noise photon counting detectors. Uh, so 10 times better than the GALAX detectors. Um, so to test those and to do many other things, pathfinding in the UV, we have the fireball balloon. Uh, it was supposed to fly this fall. It's going to be delayed till next fall, unfortunately. But we're testing both science, new technology, and there's a lot of training going on as well. Um, Future, future PIs are being trained on this program, uh, as well as a precursor to the next great, great observatory, whatever we call uh, Louvoir at the time. This is the teams involved in that. It's a multinational team, uh, mainly the French and Caltech, Columbia, Iowa, uh, Arizona, uh, Kness, and LAM. Okay, uh, we would like to do an explorer. Uh, I now believe we can both do detect CGM halos in the redshift range of order 0 to 1 and even detect the cosmic web of an emission out to redshift of 1 or 1.5. And I've learned it yesterday, particularly, that this range of evolution from Z of 1.5 to 0 is quite interesting from the point of view of the relationship of galaxies and the CGM, and we would expect quite different properties in the CGM uh, spanning the, that redshift range. Okay, at higher redshift, we have case to BI. Uh, and uh, uh, here's an example going from low redshift to high redshift. Uh, it's a very flexible uh, integral field spectrograph with multiple spectral and spatial resolutions. Um, and uh, one of the precision sky subtraction is one of the particularly important things that's unique about this instrument. It also gets very high spectral resolution up to 20,000 in certain modes. The red channel is coming online this, uh, the beginning of uh, next year. Uh, it should be back on the telescope 
by February or so, and we'll be commissioning. So looking for interesting commissioning targets for the Red Channel. And it goes out to uh, basically 11,000 angstroms, so redshift 8 in Lyman Alpha. And I, this is now looking like a very important uh, epoch in terms of the change of topology of the uh, universe from neutral to ionized. Uh, and uh, these are some of the things we might be able to do if we're crazy enough to try it. OK. Uh, now, uh, a few uh, items related to galaxies. Uh, we had this uh, result with Palomar Cosmic Web Imager showing a large rotating, uh, what we called at the time, a protogalactic disk. Uh, when we observed it with KCWI, we got a much more complicated picture. And I wondered, well, what, what is this really? Um, and, uh, and then the question is, how do you compare that to simulations? Because you, know, you have a handful of simulations, and it's very difficult to, to figure out how to make a comparison to one data cube, um, where all sorts of uh, astrophysical noise may be present in, in any given simulation. Uh, I call this the, the problem. Uh, connect, connecting simulations to, in particular, 3D data cubes. It's a new kind of data, and that's why it became an issue. It's, it's, it's not a large statistical sample of galaxies. It's individual, complex you know, gas distributions. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about how to do that. I, ideally, you have new, lot, multiple numerical simulations. Uh, and here's the, here's the real data cubes. You forward model them. And then you make, uh, w do what I call bridge modeling to connect the forward modeled simulations to uh, the, the data. And methods include toy models all the way to machine learning. And we did something like this with that, that uh, velocity map I showed you for this uh, protogalactic disk. Uh, we invented something called the multi filament inflow. It's a, just a mathematical formulation, basically uh, boiling it down to a uh, Fourier what is essentially a two-dimensional Fourier uh, expansion. And what, what we showed was that you can, uh, when you start with simple rotation and then add uh, azimuthally dependent inflows, uh, you get a very large drop in chi-squared uh, with, with the add addition of a single parameter. So that's actually the Kaki uh, information criteria. It goes down dramatically uh, with a single uh, filament radial inflow. And then for this, uh, object. This is actually a simulation. This is data. This is a real object. This is a real object that I just showed you. And it, it drops as well, but you need a three-mode uh, three, uh, uh, multi-filament inflow to, to, to sh show that dramatic drop. So that's the kind of thing you might want to do. Uh, a similar kind of uh, measurement of an outflow. This is a quasar. It's a definite bipolar outflow. Uh, and you can measure the velocity, but you actually can show that there's probably significant rotation, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, and hopefully this will get published when the stuff I'm about to tell you about uh, gets published. We're also working on the low redshift uh, CGM. Right now we're stuck with H beta with the blue channel, but soon we'll be doing it with H alpha. And we're actually detecting stuff out to 150 kiloparsecs in low, low redshift galaxies, 0.15. We're seeing a definite emission from what looks like bu uh, a bubble around galaxies. OK, now I'm going to go to the uh, uh, IGM emission topic. There have been a few uh, theoretical predictions, the pioneering ones, Hogan and Wyman, uh, and uh, Cantalupo, and then recently, recent simulations uh, have produced some uh, beautiful pictures from TNG, for example. There have been early observational hits, hints from a very deep field by Muse. Um, what did we do? Well, we used not in shuffle. This is actually originally pioneered by Tanri and uh, Sembach uh, for, for extended long slit spectroscopy. So this is a, you have a, a sky and a background, or, or an object in a background field, uh, and you go back and forth. Every two minutes, you integrate on one or the other. And you shuffle the uh, spectrum. This is 24 slice spectrum uh, back and forth. So you get you get a, a, a source in a sky. You subtract them, and you get essentially zero, except for whatever is real. Um, how do you do that when everything is sky? Well, uh, I thought about this for a while, and I realized that 
the redshift distributions will, on average, be different if you go far enough away. So the basic idea is you look at a, a field A, and then at least 10 arc minutes away, you look at a field B, and you'll get a different distribution of emission uh, just from cosmic uh, variance. Uh, and you can more or less subtract them without too much confusion or uh, subtra sub sub subtraction confusion. So this was a simulation that I did using uh, Ren Yusen's original simulation. Uh, and it showed that basically we can distinguish the red is field A and the blue is field B. And more or less, there's very little overlap. Um, so you can do this. So it seems to work. Uh, so we chose a field. We showed two, two fields, an A and a B field, in Cosmos, where there were known overdensities at different redshifts. And we used the KCWI uh, large slicer BL grading in uh, two configurations. We mosaic the two by three field uh, and rotated at different position angles uh, and did not unshuffle between these two. So we'd go from here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here, to here, and so on. Um, many, many, many nights, many foggy, snowy nights. Uh, <laughs> you all know. Uh, OK, so here's the first observation. The emission is very extended. This is a one arc minute mosaic field. And it's very correlated with galaxy traced overdensity. So this is a eight megaparsec uh, uh, galaxy overdensities as a function of uh, here wavelength, but redshift uh, co-moving distance. Anything would work. Uh, and then here is the average emission in the field. Every time you have a peak here, there's a peak in the galaxy distribution. So it's, it's very, and, and then this is on and off the peaks. There's even stuff off the peaks, but there's more on the peaks. Uh, field B, similar. Uh, here's, again, the overdensity we targeted. And then peaks, 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 peaks. Um, and there's the, the on-peak uh, distributions. OK. Uh, and you can actually do a correlation. This is the average between A and B. And there is a correlation. There may be some saturation. Uh, this is the average surface brightness and the overdensity. So very interesting. Uh, statistical properties. Uh, the voxel distribution, if you just look at the number of voxels, it's quite high when you get down to the lowest surface brightnesses. Uh, this, is, this is the nominal prediction for the uh, Lyman alpha fluorescence, it's so-called, uh, uh, of an optically thick uh, Lyman alpha cloud. Um, and uh, this is uh, where we're getting with the, we, we have to smooth to get to these uh, low surface brightnesses, but because of this exquisite sky subtraction, we can do that and smooth on large scales, so 10 arc second kind of scales. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're seeing down to this level. And we, we can actually detect individual sources. It's important the source properties vary as you change the isophote level, the voxel isophote level, essentially. And, uh, but uh, they, they match at the bright end. Whoops. They match at the bright end with, uh, for example, Mike Rock's deep uh, observations. Uh, also, it's not Lyman alpha halos. Okay, so I'll just I'll, I'll say that again a couple times. Uh, now, if you look at the sources, you might expect uh, scaling laws between CGM, IGM, and other properties. Uh, and uh, I list your favorites here. Um, and uh, uh, the sources, what we this is very preliminary, but you definitely see rotation parameter, which seems to fit uh, the uh, log normal distribution predicted. And there is a, there's actually a correlation between radius, sur, uh, velocity dispersion, and surface brightness that looks like that. Kind of amazing. Um, but that's all very preliminary. Uh, OK. Spectroscopic properties. Well, these are narrowband images uh, at, at different uh, redshifts. Uh, and these are a spectra of regions in the field. Uh, and that's the error. The yellow is the spectrum. And I've blown it up so you can see all the fainter lines. Uh, and, the, and the kicker is the bottom one is the Lyman alpha forest in absorption, except I've inverted it. So uh, spectroscopic properties. Well, this is just one pseudo slit through one slice showing the kind of things you see. This is a galaxy. This is a galaxy. This is galaxies. But maybe this is uh, acceleration as gas flows into the halo. Not sure. I'd like to know from the theorists. Uh, here are some predictions from Cantalupo. And here's some things. Here's an example, which kind of looks kind of like the prediction. 
Uh, but I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, here's, some, again, the slices. Um, here, are the, here are the spectres of the different regions. Uh, here's the absorption Lyman alpha fluoresce. I've inverted it, taken 1 minus the continuum's corrected spectrum, multiplied it by 100. Um, here's the, one of the emission regions uh, and comparison. So because I think they look the same, I'm going to come up with a new name, and the new name is going to be the emission Lyman alpha forest. And so we have to rename this the absorption Lyman alpha forest. Okay? So from now on, bear with me. I'm using this terminology. Maybe it'll catch on. Uh, uh, first of all, morphological properties. It, it is filamentary. These, by the way, are galaxies in the redshifts of the slices. Um, here's one. Uh, if you take a, a one method algorithm, substrate constrained mean shift, uh, you get this kind of distribution for, for filaments. Um, here's it, uh, those examples showing when you do that, use that algorithm, sh 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 showing what they look like. Uh, here's some comparison. It's a slightly bigger scale, like 100 times bigger local galaxy distribution, but it kind of looks the same. <laughs> Uh, and here's the original predictions, kind of looks the same. Um, OK, emission galaxy cross-correlation. You can actually do, because this is a field with lots of redshifts, a cross-correlation between the galaxy distribution and the emission. Here's a two-dimensional correlation. It shows uh, a lot of the features you see in galaxy-galaxy uh, correlations. And here's the one-dimensional radial correlation. Uh, the, you can measure a bias parameter, and it's comparable to the bias of dark matter when you do that. Uh, OK, so I'm going to make the case. Let's see how much time I have left. OK, I'm going to make the case that uh, uh, because uh, the e, e laugh, the emission Lyman alpha force is pervasive, like the absorption Lyman alpha force, uh, the spectra looks similar. Uh, the emission Lyman alpha force has a large covering factor comparable to the absorption Lyman alpha force at lowest com column densities. Uh, there is a cross correlation, I'm not going to show you, but between, there's one quasar in the B field, uh, a low resolution spectrum of the absorption Lyman alpha force for that quasar. It does show uh, uh, a detectable cross correlation. And then uh, there may be a way of getting emission that hasn't really been talked about much called continuum photon pumping. And if you ask me about that at the end, I will tell you. OK, so I'm going to go through this plot where I try to put everything about the IGM on one plot. OK, so this is the number density uh, of the emitter voxels as a function of surface brightness. So it goes up dramatically from bright to, to the threshold of our observations. Uh, this is the filling uh, factor. It's just you, multi you, you multiply by dz, you get a filling factor. So this would be 1. Uh, so we're up in near about 20%. Um, and uh, this is the filling factor of different morphological features of the cosmic web, walls, filaments, and knots or nodes. Uh, OK, if I take this dn dz and equate it to the dn dz for the absorption lime alpha forest. Um, and you can do that, <laughs> I think. Uh, and uh, you get this correspondence between uh, this number density, the surface brightness, and the column density of the absorption lime alpha forest, OK, going all the way from 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 19 or so. That has associated nomenclature, the, the lime alpha forest, lime limit systems, and so on. Uh, and there's also an association between column density and overdensity, and there's association of overdensity with walls, filaments, and knots. Um, okay, maximum source volume fraction. So we're, we, I told you that the source, uh, we can we can we can detect individual sources. These are discrete in three in voxel space in three-dimensional space in the data cube. Uh, as you change the isophote from bright, so you get individual discrete sources. Uh, as you decrease that isophote, the sources start to percolate and become larger and larger. OK, got that. Uh, and uh, so if you take the largest source in any given redshift uh, bin, uh, you get this. Uh, you get the, how much of the uh, 
emission is taken up by a single source, and this starts here and goes up to here. So a significant fraction of this is percolated single source, you know, connected in three-dimensional space. Uh, and then if you measure the a filament parameter, the length divided by the width, essentially, uh, it, it goes from r roughly one, the scales here, all the way up to 20, uh, and, then, and then saturates as you go to this lower surface brightness. So there's kind of a consistency with the morphological connections of the uh, absorption alignment alpha forest between filaments and... Um, okay, and then you can also use the correlation function to get a typical distance out of that, put everything on one plot. And finally, uh, Lyman alpha halos, the contribution is small. I, I, I have two different ways of proving that, basically from uh, observations and then simulations. Um, it's roughly a factor of 20 below what we're seeing. So there are halos, but only at the bright, bright end of the distribution. Uh, okay, that is the end, amazingly enough, except I have a movie. Uh, so I'll start that and then take questions. Okay, taking questions. <laughs> Thanks. Super exciting. Um, two questions. One, you showed a distribution of, I think you called it rotation parameter, spin parameter. Uh, that's, I assume, the orbital angular momentum of the cool CGM gas with respect to the halo, right? It is the, uh, it's just, it's just the, basically the, ra the ratio of the, the usual ratio of the rotational energy to the total based on the velocity dispersion. So it's right. a very simple empirical parameter. But with respect to the center of the halo that you're associating this with, I get, I, wh where I'm going with this is there are lots of claims, uh, yeah. a couple of observational, but mostly from simulations yeah. that filaments themselves have these internal ha like, like helical motions or, or spin motions. I wonder I what you think are the prospects for observing that. Uh, it's possible. We should be able to do it. Uh, and uh, I've been asked, actually was asked that question last week. <laughs> uh, I really want to do it. Uh, so yeah, we, but I don't, ha I don't have anything for you at this point. Yeah. Sure. And uh, well, if I have another, uh, so I just probably missed this at the very end. You were comparing the, the uh, ELAF and the um, ALAF. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think it was on there and I just must have uh, missed it. The sources for the ELAF are not the same cloud, very low column density clouds that are basically populating the absorption Lyman alpha forest, right? The emi emitted Lyman alpha forest surely comes from either much denser structures that would be either Lyman limit systems or sub DLAs or, or, or something like that. Uh, no, my, my, this, okay, so this is what I would have thought too, and I was surprised by mm -hmm. the pervasiveness of this emission. So uh, it turns out that there is a emission process that hasn't really been talked about much called continuum photon pumping. And I alluded, there was a little line saying, ask me about it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so <laughs> the basic idea is there's a continuum uh, from galaxy, star forming galaxies uh, in the metagalactic UV background. There's also Lyman alpha, but that's local to any given gas. Um, but uh, the continuum, if you take the continuum and multiply it by uh, one minus the continuum corrected Lyman, typical Lyman alpha forest, you get a lot of emission features at the level of we're, that we're seeing. So it doesn't, so you can get emission from what, from gas that is producing absorption, as long as you resolve out the individual sources, so you're not adding them together with the emission. So that's a new way of getting it, even at low column densities. That's my point. Would you be able to use this to tell if this large-scale cosmic filament or sheet were shattered into very tiny, clumpy, cold fragments due to thermal instabilities? Uh, with enough telescope time. <laughs> sure. All right, thank you. That's always the answer. The questions. Sandy? 
looking at the movie, I'm struck by all those little small sources. Yeah. Some of which persist for a thousand kilometers a second. What do you think those are? Uh, well, they may be uh, currently unidentified Lyman Alpha emitters. Over a long, over a large wavelength range? Uh, that I'm not sure, but some of them are continuum galaxies, and some of them, some of them are Lyman Alpha emitters that haven't been identified yet. So, yeah. I think this is super interesting. Um, one question I had, the absorption Lyman alpha forest saturates eventually. Eventually you get zero flux, right. but the emission Lyman alpha forest is, is in principle unbounded. So is there additional information in the statistics of the emission Lyman alpha forest that would be more informative than what the absorption Lyman alpha forest can give you? Um, that, that's a, Deep question. <laughs> I'm sure there has to be. I mean, there is. Um, if it's if it's due to the scattering, I mean, it's going to be the sum of this plus other processes, radio re recombination and collisional excitation in certain situations. So, so it's going to be more complicated in that sense, or differently complicated. Uh, so, I think we need to do a lot of work in modeling to understand exactly what we are learning about the physical conditions, yeah. So I, that's not a real answer, but I'm, I'm starting to think about it. Hopefully other, others will. Thanks, Chris. Fascinating. Um, do you have enough redshift range to check out the average widths of the features you're looking at? Because I think the theorists will tell you that the sizes of these filaments should... Uh, the the average the uh, width spatial width? Yes, spatial widths of the filament should be changing with redshift. Do you have enough redshift? Oh, range with, to red, with redshift. Yes. No, this is a, very small, this is right? a relatively small 2.2 yeah, .2 okay. to 2.45. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Yeah. we will be doing parallel observations when we add the red channel. We have to choose a redshift range. That's uh -huh. going to be heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. uh, any suggestions would be, you know, to see, yeah. see evolution and also to probe the epoch of reionization. So we want to do all that. And you gave um, us a teaser example of two galaxies in which there might be a bridge between them. Do you have enough of those to check out whether uh, galaxies that are pretty close to each other have such uh, filamentary connections? Well, in, in all the cases where we have galaxies, we find emission between them. Yeah. Final question. A beautiful talk. The, uh, can you say a bit more about combining the ELAF and the ALAF to do uh, to to very well constrain the temperature of the gas to sort of disentangle turbulent broadening from thermal broadening, and sort of getting at the equation of state uh, as a function of redshift is something you know the theorists have thought that it might give a very good constraint on reionization history. Uh, I, I think the answer would be no, I can't yet. <laughs> um, and uh, there's going to be, um, to the extent that they're different, yeah, we'll get different constraints on the, on the velocity distribution, the turbulent distribution. Uh, the key is we can map it spatially. Um, so we can look at kinematics you know, as a function of uh, uh, projected distance. Um, so that's an additional constraint. I mean, we can, we can measure rotation, we can, you know, projected rotation, we can measure um, that question about filaments. Uh, so so it's, it's definitely a different constraint because we can me measure it continu contiguously in space as well as, um, you know, along the, along the redshift line of sight. So I'm hoping we can. I haven't thought deeply about that particular question yet. Okay, let's thank Chris again. It is now lunchtime. We'll reconvene in a couple of hours. <laughs> I have no idea we could do this.